Yeah, there's actually, you know, myth, myths and misperceptions among just general public. There's also myths and misperceptions even within the healthcare community. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we are constantly trying to tackle those things, and, and um, you know, we want people, the more, the more people know, the more they can help themselves. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to Healthy Living Wichita Podcast with Go Time Training. I'm your host, Raymond Elliott, lead personal trainer at GoTime Training in Northeast Wichita, Kansas. I've been in the fitness industry for over 20 years now, and I've seen it all. This podcast cuts through all the fads and gimmicks to give you the science-based truth on all things fitness and nutrition, so you don't have to try to figure it out on your own. If you want to live happier and healthier and get the scoop on how to work out, eat right, and keep a positive mindset, you're in the right place. It's go time. Now, let's get to the show. All right, so we're here, Healthy Living okay. Wichita. We got a, a very special guest today, um, Coney Barnett, but I'll, I'll let you, you probably know a little bit more about you than I do. Okay. So we'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself, <laughs> tell the wonderful viewers who you are, and we'll get rocking and rolling. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, Cody Barnett, and I'm uh, with Body Works Physical Therapy and Concussion Center. It's a physical therapy practice that we started in 2005. Nice. Um, and so our specialty is uh, we want to help uh, keep people active and mobile and off pain pills. Oh, that's, that's so good um, reasons. Yeah. Good so mission. that's 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 our mission. That's our that's our vision. That's our mission statement. Yeah. And um, so everything that we do is kind of keyed into to that, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, in terms of things that we specialize in, we specialize in orthopedic conditions. So okay. things like back pain, neck pain, shoulders, hips, knees, feet, um, yeah. things of that nature uh, is what what uh, all that we do. And then we also about uh, six or seven years ago started a concussion treatment program as well. Okay. Uh, so uh, that ties in a lot with orthopedics and a lot of the population that we see as well. So oh, wow. uh, it's, been, it's a nice little um, uh, group of people that haven't been able to really get help here in Wichita. And so obviously that's, you know, uh, yeah. been a big need and we're, we've, we've, been blessed to be able to help people um through that too that's really cool yeah i haven't heard a lot of places i mean that's kind of a niche for you guys specifically i would Mm -hmm. imagine i mean i'm sure there are probably some blends of that throughout other physical therapy but nobody's really made that like as a staple of something to really focus on so i'm sure that's benefiting and helping a a lot of people that that go through those um situations and need some help through that so a lot of people suffering yeah well we love physical therapists here uh we've kind of as you know as a gym is kind of involved into a niche where we work with a lot of people with pain i actually went to a pain-free um, performance specialty in, in Seattle under Dr. John Russ and, and he was saying, you know, like raise your hand who has pain here and 90% of the room mm-hmm. did. And these are all active personal training coaches that should be in shape. And he's like, look at all you guys. He's like, if we don't work with people that have pain, we're pretty much out of business, but we have to be careful within our scope of practice. And so we don't, you know, we don't treat pain, mm-hmm. we don't diagnose it. So we need to have incredible people like you that we can uh, refer our clients to, or we can co-manage and you guys can help educate and say, Hey, you know, these are things they can do. Here's a great tolerance and that things. And um, we're really, as personal trainers, uh, I think in all physical therapists and all of us kind of deep down would like to have that as a, as a field or a background or kind of wish that sure. we went into it because it's uh, we care about obviously the same mission statement you have, keeping people mobile, yeah. off pain uh, meds uh, and the same thing. Um, we also try to, you know, help them out with a little bit of weight loss, which helps out with those yeah. things as well. So absolutely, that's, that's cool. So we see a lot of different things. Like I said, our scope of practice is very limited, and so, you know, there's not a lot of things that we know, but we know that there's lots of uh, misconceptions and mis... Um Let's see what we got. Misconceptions and misperceptions out there and that, you know, there's a lot of myths just period. You know, mm-hmm. people have different ideas on things. What are some of those things that you see that you see that a lot of people um, just don't know what they don't know uh, when it comes to some of these injuries yeah. and aches and pains that you see? Yeah, there's actually, you know, myth, myths and misperceptions among just general public. There's also myths and misperceptions even within the healthcare community. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we are constantly trying to tackle those things and, and um, you know, we want people, the more the more people know, the more they can help themselves, right? Right, yeah, knowledge So um, we want to we want to help educate people so that then they can even help take care of themselves and fix themselves. So. Yeah. That's that's part of what we love to do. So one of the the, the big ones that we run into a lot because um, we see a lot of people with back and neck pain and back mm-hmm. and neck problems is the the proverbial uh, slip disc, bulging disc, yeah, I hear that all the time, um, things of that nature, and um, and so uh, one of them is is that like people that have back pain. Um, 
uh, automatically assume I've got a bulging disc right. or maybe they've, they've had an MRI done and it showed a bulging disc right. um, or, or something. Right. And um, so one of the misperceptions, and this is not just me saying this, this is partly <laughs> my experience, but it's also right. there's, there's people that, that research this for a living. And this is the people that research this for, for a living have, have found this as well. Right. And that is there's tons of us out here uh, that have bulging discs. And in yeah. fact, statistically, by the time we're age 30, all of us, if we're human, <laughs> right. um, well, most of us have, are. have at least one bulging disc or some beginning arthritis in our spine. Right. So you hear that, you go, oh my gosh, well, that's horrible. 30 years old, really? Yeah, yeah. But it's just like, you know, we get gray hair, you know, our vision goes a little bit bad, <laughs> right. whatever. Um, and so it's just part of one of those things is, is part of aging. And yeah. so, um, uh, so frequently people kind of feel like, or when they come into our office, they kind of have self-labeled themselves. Oh, I can't do this because I have a bulging, a bulging disc, disc or, or something of, of similar to that. And so um, what we want to do is we want to do a really good exam. We want to take a really, really good history. And uh, I want to learn as much as I can about you and what are the things that make you hurt, what makes you feel better, right. um, what times of day, you know, what, how is this affecting you? And then um, based on when you get your pain and how you get your pain and what relieves your pain and all of those little detail things. Right. And then we combine that with a really good exam. Um, sometimes we find that, the, the disc may indeed be causing the problem. Right, yeah, that could be, okay? yeah. But sometimes we find, you know what? You just got a bulging disc, and that has absolutely nothing to do with your pain problem. Right, yeah, it's not even um, related. And so um, it varies, you know, but what we always want to do is we always want to triangulate um, what the patient's uh, telling us and their story and and how does that match up with what we see when what we the do data an exam. Yeah, and exam. then how does that match up with whatever imaging may have been done and triangulate all of those things. And those things should all um, fit together um, and jive like pieces of a puzzle. Right. They should um, the and if they don't, then we got to go, okay, there's, there's maybe there's something else at play here that we need to work on that, that needs to be better. Yeah. And, um, and so that's like, uh, that's literally something that we run into every day, every day of my world. Um, we're constantly, um, figuring that out. Is this truly say the, the the bulging disc or the other thing that um, is a real common thing is people see their healthcare provider and um, and sometimes these seeds get planted and I you know I call them seeds of fear right you know somebody goes in and let's say you're you're 50 years old and um, and the healthcare provider says to you oh my gosh you have the back of an 80 year old Right. Well, what does that do? <laughs> right, yeah. It you, makes you not want to be able to do anything, it right? Yeah. Fr it freaks you, you out. Yeah, of course, yeah. Right? Um, and so, you know, somebody wants to, to come work out. Yeah. And like, uh, I don't think I can do anything. I have the back, the back of an 80-year-old. Yeah. And, and so that perception drives drives myths response, and drives misperceptions. Yeah. And so sometimes just giving people permission to go, you know what? You've started getting this stuff by age statistically by age 30 All right um, and this is just part of aging and yeah. you know there's things that you can do that you can do right yeah um, let's figure out what those things are right yeah i think that's um, really powerful we get a lot of people that are that come in just like that they either from their doctor or says something that i can't do this or do any of those things and we never ever want to you know go over a doctor obviously in the health allied continuum a uh, physical therapist chiropractors and then of course your medical doctors or whatever always oh, supersede our opinions but sometimes we're like you know, I think, you know, we might be able to get into some deadlift patterns. Or, mm -hmm. Are you ever going to pick anything up? I'm like, yeah, probably. I'm like, okay, well, we should probably learn how to do that properly. Uh, and we try to help teach people and obviously mm -hmm. stay away from pain. But, you know, sometimes they just, their confidence is so, they're yeah. so scared and so afraid. So it's nice really because, you know, you're going to make those uh, stopping points. You're going to have mm -hmm. those blocks, those mental blocks, and it's going to not allow you to be able to, to, to do things. Even like being near somebody when they're doing a, a, an exercise actually mm -hmm. helps get them past some of their own mental blocks and yep. things like that. So, yeah, it's a powerful when uh, people put that negativity yep. kind of into your head or that perception. Um, so that's awesome that you guys kind of like try to figure out a way yeah. around that and see what we can really do. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's, it's uh, to your point about being able to, to lift something, you know, there's – we have life. We have, do, <laughs> yeah. we have to do life, right? Activity daily living, right? So let's so let's figure out how we can make that happen and, and safely, right? right? Within within safe parameters. But what does that look like and, and how do we get there and that sort of thing? And so um, yeah. that's really fun when people get to do that and they go, Oh wow, I, I never thought I could do this. Yeah, yeah. And they go, Yeah, you can do this. You can do it, yeah. That's all. and I'm sure that's probably empowering. Once you create some self efficacy, I'm sure that helps 
continue on. Uh, I think it's good to have some self-awareness and be able to like know that I have some pain and I need mm -hmm. to be really hyper aware of what I'm doing and how I'm feeling and what mm -hmm. I'm going on because sometimes people uh, disregard that. Right. But it's also very nice to have that confidence and be able to move forward and know that you're progressing and look kind of uh, for what's next in your, uh, I guess, journey mm -hmm. throughout your 80-year-old back when it's not really as big of, a, of an issue as that. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love yeah. that, you know, with physical therapy, we, you know, we do a functional movement screens, we do a postural analysis, and we do a few things like that, which gives us a little bit of intel, mostly on like muscular imbalances, not a mm -hmm. lot with structure. Uh, once again, we don't really diagnose all those things. If someone has pain, we avoid them. But I love how you guys investigate so much to find things. I always kind of say like personal trainers, um, we have a, a very small knowledge. So we see, you know, hoof prints in the sand, we're going to automatically assume it's a horse, not a zebra. Right. Where you guys can go and be like, nope, that's a zebra. Because <laughs> we did five different uh, analyses to figure that out. And based on your investigation stage yeah. through conversation and whatever else you see, you can have a better idea, which is a lot better than a blanket treatment. We're going to blankly treat. We're going to increase hip mobility, thoracic spine mobility, and increase your core strength. Mm -hmm. That's about it. That's about what we know to help out a lower back and, and ensure that you're doing things in, in a structure where you guys can really go in and be like, no, it's this area, this area, this is what's causing that, uh -huh. uh, which is really, really cool, I think, uh, and why people need to see you when they have some of those issues. Yeah, and, some, and sometimes this can be really simple. You know, it's maybe somebody doesn't have pain, but they just wake up every morning and their, and their back is really stiff. Yeah. And by the time they get the shower and their cup of coffee and whatever, you know, things are feeling better. Well there's a lot of just that's kind of a minor relatively minor thing All right in the yeah. scheme of things but but yet you know there's a lot of times where people have stuff that they just put up with for a long time mm -hmm. and it's like you know what you don't need to be living with this <laughs> right. know, this, this is fixable let's, yeah. let's let's work on it so that's good so basically you're saying most people will have a bulging disc by the age of 30 and 41 so probably multiple ones uh and so that might not be that might not be really the issue and you kind of mm -hmm. need to like figure out if it's something more than that just because yeah. you have a bulging disc could literally mean nothing uh you could have some other areas of pain or something else that's causing that yeah um even like a muscle strain uh, and, and and to be fair like i'm i want to be make make that really clear is that <laughs> yeah sometimes it is the bulging it disc, can be the bulging disc right but, but it doesn't always have to but be. let's figure that out and figure figure out if that's truly what's going on or is there something else right yeah um i've got a a, a a person I'm seeing right now who's probably mid 50 ish has had about a 10 year history of back problems mm -hmm. and, and really has greatly affected her life. And she'd had a, a surgery at a, a lower part of her lower back. Right. Okay. And, um, um, did relatively well. Pain came back, mm -hmm. um, and, um, had some more imaging done and um, and it showed a bulge, a new bulging disc, relatively high up in the back. Okay. Yeah. And so the, the thought process is that's what's causing this. Right. Well, we go through the exam, and she tells me more, more about where her pain is and so forth, and we discover that her pain patterns don't match at all the well, level of where this new bulging disc is at. Like yeah. it's anatomically. Um, they're anatomically separate, right? They're not feasible um, for that. In terms that. of the way the nerves are routed and right, so forth, yeah. it's like no, this this doesn't make this sense. Anatomically, is not. It can't be coming from that. Yeah, we got to look at something else. And so, you know, that's that would be a classic case of where we go. Okay, yeah, we found some stuff, but is the stuff that we found really match up with what? Yeah, with what you're seeing. That's cool. Yeah. So, and I'm sure that you know that takes a different treatment and different mm -hmm. idea and so you might be treating somebody for a bulging disc and whatever uh, exercises and rehab you use that and that's with something opposite um or something that you know may benefit but not mm -hmm. really it's when you can individualize something really have an idea what it is yeah. you can obviously target a lot better and, and do a lot more work for somebody Absolutely. that's cool absolutely so um what are some other um areas uh i know that i kind of spoke with you a little bit we have a lot of clients right now they're probably watching want to know that you know have like golfer's elbow and mm -hmm. tennis elbows and that has a lot of misconception and people struggle kind of understanding you know with tendonitis and all yep. those different things so what are some um you know things you can do you That's, have any ideas on those? that is a big one because we, we we see lots of elbows and um tendonitis and tendinopathies and and so here's a here's a story. This is this is like <laughs> this is like you know average. I'm I'm, make, I'm 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 kind of exaggerating and right. generalizing a little bit um, <laughs> just to have a little fun with it. But here's a person that comes in and they um, they've got elbow pain. Right. And um, let's say they're maybe they're a pickleball player or maybe they're a gardener. And I'm probably or, seeing a lot more of the pickleball players or, with elbow issues. Or we see we 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 see a lot of pickleball players. <laughs> um, love I love pickleball. 
Um, but um, it's keeping you in business. Well, no, no <laughs> like, I, I'm just like you enjoy actual pickleball. I, I yeah, actually I enjoy you. playing pickleball. I got it. Yeah, but um, but anyway, a person comes in. They said, "Yeah, I had this elbow pain, so I I quit um, uh, I quit gardening or I quit playing pickleball. I took six weeks off. Um, I took my ibuprofen right. and whatever, and then it went away. My pain went away. Yeah. So then I went back to gardening or I went back to pickleballing or, or tennis playing or whatever, whatever it is they do, golfing. Yeah. And, and by golly, it came back. It's <laughs> right. like it, it never left. Right. It was there the whole time. And so, like, this is a story we hear a lot. And um, basically what that is is that's a sign that somebody doesn't have a tendonitis. It's what, the, what we call a tendinopathy. Okay. And they're com- two different animals. So tendonitis is an inflammation of, right. of, a, uh, of a structure. Um, tendinopathy is um, an actual change in the tendon structure itself um, that for something that's been there longer so things that are more, relatively more chronic that have been going on say six weeks plus yeah um, that sort of a thing there's actually a change in the connective tissue uh, it literally looks different so if you look at um, a tendon um, under uh, a microscope right. uh, tendon tissue under a microscope and if it's a tendonitis it'll be inflamed if it's a tendinopathy, it actually is not inflamed. The tissue changes. There's extra blood vessels that get infiltrated in the tissue. Okay. And the collagen actually looks more disorganized. So for people that aren't aware of collagen and what that looks like, um, collagen is connective tissue right. that makes up our tendons. And collagen normally should be very uniform. If you look at it under a microscope, all of the fibers are going to be very uniform. They're all running in the same it's direction, really, and yeah. they're all really densely packed. Um, so I compare that to our hair after we've combed it. Right. We comb our hair, all the hairs are going the same direction, and it looks really nice, right? right. Um, and if we look at collagen under a microscope, in a case of tendinopathy, um, it looks a little bit more like bedhead, <laughs> right? right? How, um, our hairs, hair looks all like the hair hairs are going different right, directions, yeah. and instead of being really densely packed collagen, it's just kind of uh, more loosely packed and kind of going everywhere. Right. So, um, so we treat that. We have to treat it different. We have to treat that differently than if it's just inflamed, inflamed, and, inflamed right? right? And so that's why the person that takes the six weeks off and then go back to their activity and it's still there, that's why it never, it, it's, it never went, it, it was never always there. You just wasn't because the not tissue, utilizing it. the tissue hasn't changed. Right. Yeah. The it's tissue, the tissue problem is still there. So, um, so we treat that differently. And so the way we do that is, uh, this is where exercise comes in because there's a type of exercise that's literally more powerful than any drug that's been manufactured ever. Oh, I want to know um, that one. <laughs> and, it's, and, and you know you know what it is. You you may not know where I'm going with my this, but, <laughs> yeah. but you're you're well aware of this, and it's it's eccentric exercise. Oh uh, yeah yeah. So eccentric exercise is where a muscle is put under tension, where it's being lengthened, right? Yeah. Instead of being shortened. Elongated. Um, how I always remembered it in school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if we put tension on a on a tendon while it's being elongated, and we and we do it in a prescribed way. Um, it does have to be dosed just like we dose a drug wow. in that um, if you do too much, it aggravates things and makes things worse. Yeah. Um, so we always have to load but not overload. To find the line. But if we, if we um, dose it correctly and we do the right amount of repetitions and the right number of times a day and so forth, then what happens is that cues your body and our body will actually start to change that collagen tissue back to normal healthy collagen again. Really? Really. That's, that's amazing. That's really, and, really cool. Um, and it's it's very well documented. Tons of research on this. Um, and um, uh, but it's it. it's it's again, you know, uh, nobody knows about it right. because um, you know if it's it's you know if you watch television, it's all about advertisements for um, medications. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, insides for, and different things. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, um, there's there's um, you know, there's not the kind of money in exercise that right, there yeah. is in drugs. Right, basically. right, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, we don't have, you know, commercials doing the, during the Super Bowl for eccentric yeah. exercise. Right, yeah. Um, but the in terms of the power of it, and as long as we dose it correctly, what happens is as we apply that exercise, then um, your body will actually change that tissue back. Your, your body will fix itself. That's crazy. We just got to give it the right inputs. Yeah. And if we give it the right inputs in the right amounts, um, it gets better. Yeah, you have to just kind of find that find the line. Is that difficult to kind of uh, prescribe the the amount that you need? And, and 
most, I think most people probably know what eccentric is, and you kind of said it, the elongation of the muscles, mm-hmm. but basically the negative phase or the lowering phase of the exercise, which a lot of people forget about, which we actually find mm-hmm. sometimes there's lots of studies that actually said there's more hypertrophy or building muscle in that phase than there is in that concentric or the positive phase. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it also can cause a little bit more muscle um, soreness, I think, because there's probably mm-hmm. a, could be. So that might, for tendonitis, you know, eccentric might not be the ideal thing because it might add a little bit more stress to it. It might work mm-hmm. for tendonitis as well. Um, I know some isometrics sometimes work, but yeah, it's finding that line. Is that a difficult thing? So, is it just kind of trial and error until you can kind of get it or? Well, it's kind of, guys- yeah, good question. So it's kind of a combination of, of um, being aware of, you know, there's people that, that research this for a living. Right. So reading the research and staying up on the research and kind of Helps. knowing what that is. And then uh, the real, um, the part that's the, the most interesting to me is then taking, you know, research is good and I'm glad we have it, yeah. but then how does that apply to, if I'm treating you, yeah. it might be different than if I'm treating somebody who's, how to decipher um, and individualize it. who might be, Nobody. let's say, um, you know, 75 right. and a little, you know, have some other issues going on in, in their, in their physical body. So how do we apply that to the person that's sitting in front of us? And then kind of marrying the two, going, okay, I want to apply this principle, but I need to fit it into this person. What does that look like? Yeah. Start there, you know, and um, and then see how their body responds. Based on that, you make little tweaks or changes appropriately yeah, you as you go. Adjustments, and, yeah, and based on assessments and kind of looking over their overall progress. That's that's pretty cool. I mean, that's a, that's that's it's amazing what the body can do. So if, you know, physiologically, actually change itself based on mm-hmm. on that load and everything going through. And I never, yeah. I have a lot of people. I know that. Uh, uh, tennis elbow and, and golfer's elbow or medial and lateral epicondylitis, they, those uh, um, sometimes tend to be a problem for people for a, a long time. And mm-hmm. it's kind of hard sometimes for us to really help people out. We try to do different things, you know, like ball grips and mm-hmm. the different stretches and sometimes doing some myofascial release through there. But uh, it could be that. And we basically mm-hmm. are not doing anything for the actual structure. So we got to uh, change not, the tissue. you got to change the tissues. Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. that might be a part where we're just like, hey, this is ongoing. We haven't seen any relief from it. Uh, this is yep. a good time to, to see a physical therapist start doing some of those things. And so for the people watching out there, um, <laughs> or listening, watching, or listening, or, watching or or listening um, um, the longer it goes, the harder it is to fix. Okay. So, you so know, quickly. human nature, right? Yeah. Um, oh, it's, all, it's not that bad. I'll, right. rub, I'll rub a little dirt on it. Yeah. Um, you know, I just rub a little dirt on it. It'll go away. Um, and, um, but the longer it goes, then the harder it is to fix because the more that tissue changes. Right. So it's, it's advantageous, you know, to, to get on it relatively, relatively sooner. Is and then it, it makes it easier to, to fix it. How do you identify like the difference between the two? Cause I'm sure the probably the pain is the pain normally is within the, the same area you know like if you have tennis or golfers elbows typically mm-hmm. going to be in those upper condyles on the on the sides you can sometimes like i can palpate my golfers yep. right now yep. uh you can palpate it is it is there's a different diagnosis for it or just kind of like this is not working or is it is it because it's prolonged like hey this has been longer than six weeks this is this is probably an automatic or at least assumption that it's this instead yeah so mo- most patients don't like you taking a, a tissue sample of their they tendon. don't they yeah. don't okay that's um, so, and putting okay. it under a microscope yeah yeah, yeah. so um so but um part a lot of it is is history yeah so you know the person that comes in and gave that story that i gave earlier right. like that's that's pretty they're pretty much diagnosing themselves Their right cool um and then the other is is is, is palpation um, identifying what movements hurt versus right. what movements don't. don't. Um, uh, I have a patient right now I'm seeing that had a, um, she's, she's actually better now, so she doesn't have it anymore, Good. but she had a, um, a tendinopathy of her biceps tendon where it tendon. attaches down here on the elbow. Oh, yeah. Um, and so oh. she's one where, um, she could, if she did a, a shortening or a concentric exercise where she's bending her elbow right. up, hurt like crazy. But when we'd resist her in the eccentric or the or the negative phase, yeah. it's like pain free. Didn't bother at all. Right. So it's it's crazy. It's right, like, yeah. Yeah, that should hurt, right? Right, yeah. Um, but because of because it's a tendinopathy, mm-hmm. um, that actually will feel better to her and um, and so that kind of you that know helps helps identify well. your that's, diagnosis. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, we also see uh, a lot of people with. Uh, I'm gonna just try to get all the information I can out on this time, with, uh, so I can utilize it. No, but uh, uh, plantar fasciitis too. Uh-huh. Uh, is there some myths or some things? That, I know that's kind of a confusing thing of mm-hmm. like diagnosing that and kind of figuring out. And some people uh, will misdiagnose plantar mm-hmm. fasciitis because they have heel pain, so it's automatically mm-hmm. that's plantar fasciitis. But um, yeah. 
I don't know if you wanted to speak on sure. it at all. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> we'll go through all of them. Um, we, we got about 12 more injuries that we're going to talk about now. I'm just like, <laughs> okay. I'll let we you go that. after this one, Cody. We can do that. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, when, when, first thing when people start to get this, what, what's the first thing people do? Just take a wild guess. When they have plantar fasciitis? When they have heel, they have heel pain, what do they do? Uh, well, I normally uh, like try to get a like a foam roller or a ball on mine, but I don't know what a, other people change well, their shoes probably. Well, that's because you you've got some knowledge <laughs> a little bit, so, yeah, so no. you know kind of some things to start. But what if somebody knows like absolutely nothing? What what's the very first thing people do when they when they probably ice it or get new shoes or um, do incense? Think, 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 think. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Drugs. Um, um, Doctor Google. Uh, well, of course, yeah. We're always they, gonna Google everything. They go, yeah, they yeah. go, they go to Doctor Google first. WebMD is probably just gonna tell you you have cancer. That's all it ever <laughs> yeah. tells you. You're like, I have heel pain. It's cancer. Yeah, You're, you got three weeks. Yeah, but uh, yes, yeah, Google. So, of Doctor, they go to Doctor yeah. Google, I've, and they and they find they find some videos on YouTube, and um, you know, and, and you know, whatever, whatever, whatever they get to. So, um, one of the one of the real common things is, um, uh, it, again, it depends on which which video you watch on YouTube when you Google <laughs> right. it, but. Um, uh, but uh, there's a, a lot of misperceptions as far as mechanics and anatomy and, right. and the people have their own theories and so forth. Um, and so one of them is, is that everybody that has this is an overpronator. Right. Okay. Yeah. And statistically speaking, more people that overpronate will have this. Right. So statistically that is accurate. But there's lots of people out there that I see that have, that are under pronators that, that their feet don't pronate at all and their, right. their arches don't high, collapse at all. They, they, and... they, they, st- they still get it. And so um, it boils down again to to doing a good exam and, and looking at the anatomy and the mechanics and, and knowing and understanding that stuff. So, for example, um, a certain percentage of people with plantar fasciitis um, have lost mobility in their big toe. So, if their big toe doesn't bend well, um, the big toe is attached to the plantar fascia. Right. And so, if the big toe doesn't bend well or doesn't bend backwards well, then that puts more mechanical load on the tissue and the tissue attaches on her heel. Right. So the, the problem is technically in the tissue, but the weak link in the chain is the attachment point at the back, the, of, the the back of the heel. So the pain ends up being in the heel. Right. The problem is actually in the, in the midfoot or in, in the, the big mid. toe. So um, people will go to the Walgreens or somewhere and they'll get these splints that go on their foot mm-hmm. um, to help keep their foot at a 90 degree angle when they sleep at night. Right, yeah, I've seen that um, for ankle. And, um, and that doesn't work so well because it, it doesn't do anything for their big toe. Right, yeah, it's not so, um, for the Now, I'm talking about somebody that's got a big toe limitations, but not everybody with plantar fasciitis right, yeah, has a big toe limitation. Right, you're not saying that that's the only reason, but, but that but, could be but one I'm, of the reasons. Yeah, so if you if you have this and you're wondering, how do I tell if you want to grab your big toe and pull it back, um, and you, you've you had um, you know middle school geometry, you can, <laughs> you can guess at the angle, and if your big toe um, bends, say, about 30 to 45 degrees, that's not very much. That's a very limited. But if it bends back like 60 to 75 degrees, that's quite a bit. So if you look at it and it's not bending very far, that's a sign that, hey, your big toe needs to bend better. Yeah. Um, and so there's things that we can do from a therapy standpoint. There's things that we can teach you to do to help make your big toe loosen up and be better. Um, there's actually um, night splints that we utilize that incorporate that, where they actually pull your foot up and also incorporate your big toe. toe well. um, that helps um, the healing process of your plantar fasciitis. So there's there's things that we can do that way. So we have to identify what's the mechanics. Yeah. Um, the other thing that sometimes happens is, is people, um, have hips that rotate in more. And so maybe they've got some weak weakness in their glutes yeah. and their rear end muscles. Uh, <laughs> maybe they're excessively tight in the front of their hips right. or, or other things that are causing their hips to roll in Internal too much. Rotate. And because the hips are rolling in too much, then that causes the foot to roll over to the inside. Right. And that's causing the increased load and pressure on, on the plantar yeah. fascia you see that sometimes so, you get flexors it, it will into your pelvic tilt which will kind of actually mm-hmm. internally rotate absolutely um, to fit the femur head kind of into and then that will sometimes cause people to have some yeah bigger issues um, yeah absolutely so that rotates everything in right as that rotates them in then as their foot um as they toe off their foot ends up rolling inward right and then that collapses the inside part of the arch yeah. and then that um then loads the plantar fasciitis and causes the heel pain. So the symptoms are the same. The, you know, we call it the squeaky wheel. The squeaky wheel is the, the same. same. The, the heel pain, but is it 
Is it a um, is it a hip problem that's causing that? Is it a big toe limitation that's causing? It? Is it a yeah. a, a true um, flat footed arch collapse that's causing the problem? Yeah. And 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 each one of those things we're going to treat them differently. Right. Yeah. It's the same. You know, I mean, we may have five people come in with all plantar fasciitis, but we might treat all five of those people slightly differently. Yeah. Based on. Yes, yeah, so you might need to like them. activate the glutes more, get right. them firing stronger, and then maybe stretch or somehow relax the hip flexors or yeah. the adductors, whatever is causing that internal rotation. And that literally might fix your plantar fasciitis, and you're not even focusing on the foot that much. Right. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it's amazing. It's all one kinetic chain, and it, it kind of all goes together. See, I'm flat footed, yep. so I'll get plantar fasciitis every once in a while, mm -hmm. and it can be pretty bad. It was just really bad not too long ago because I was um, putting up uh, curtain rods. Yeah. So I was just on a, a, a steps or a ladder yep. for so long, going up and down. I think just like, uh, you know, uh, plantar flexing and just trying to be in that position. I'm mm -hmm. short, so I probably had to like stand on my tippy toes even on a ladder. It's yep. sad. Don't make fun of me. I know you're like seven foot three. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to talk about your basketball career after this. But anyways, yeah, it was really, really bad. And it normally goes away and I had to foam roll, but I really never looked into uh -huh. it more. But I'm sure being flat footed makes me pronate. And I actually kind of externally rotate when I walk. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if it's compensation or hamstrings. I don't know. We'll get in all that. I'll come mm -hmm. in. Well, we can we can diagnose yeah. it all. But yeah, it's, it's so it's neat. So it's basically you know, kind of what I got from you is that that it could be a lot of different things. So it's not just because one thing a doctor Google says one thing mm -hmm. or there somebody diagnoses you with this situation doesn't mean that paints the whole picture, mm -hmm. uh, and that each thing could potentially have a different treatment um, or have a totally different thought process. And until you kind of can identify that through mm -hmm. assessments and conversation and uh, imaging. Um, you really don't exactly know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like we said, just because there's hoof prints in the, in the yep. sand doesn't always mean it's a horse. It could so, be a zebra, horse or, a zebra or your hip yep. or whatever. I don't know what other animals that have hoof prints like that, <laughs> but I'm sure there's other animals that are similar. I don't know. They all look the same. So yeah, it could absolutely. be a cat. I don't know. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> okay. Maybe if I, if I, if I'm misdiagnosing that, then maybe I shouldn't be here. That was our camera. So now we're just uh, live on, uh, on iTunes and, uh, Spotify. Okay. okay. But anyways, um, um, is there anything else that you want to, to go through Cody? Are you, uh, yeah, I would just say, um, in terms of, of, you know, people ask a lot of times, you know, as it's human nature, we all want to know, we all want to know the magic answer, right? Yeah, of course. And, um, and kind of one of the things that, that I say a lot to people is, well, any good medical question, the answer is, is usually it depends. Yeah, always. Yeah. And so, um, even though we like to have stock answers and we like to, to tell people that, right. you know, the right thing, a lot of times, um, uh, and I, my wife will, um, say that I can be a little bit long winded. Um, but the bottom line is, is it, it a lot of times it depends, you know, yeah. is it, is why do I, why do I have problem X, Y, Z? Well, it depends on this, this, and this let's figure out what those things are right. so that we can then, 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 you know, treat, get down, basically we want to get down to the root cause of the problem right. and figure out the root cause and, you know, using the squeaky wheel analogy, sometimes the thing that's hurting is not necessarily the that, root cause. That's that's what's where our pain is at. If we go back to our, our elbow problem, right. you know, we also want to be looking at um, things in terms of shoulder, shoulder mobility, middle back mobility. Right. Um, so let's let's use our pickleball player as an example again. Uh, maybe they um, are lacking some shoulder mobility in a certain direction, and so because of that, they're then compensating with a weird angle with their wrist right. to make up for it. And so more. we fix the the shoulder mobility problem, and then that offloads the elbow, and then you know the elbow pain gets better. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So. I think it's cool to look at those things, and that's why we have people like you that are able to have that knowledge and understand that that it, it could be from a different area. I mean, I think we see a lot of problems just with uh, scapula causing lots of even lower back problems mm -hmm. could be within uh, poor range of motion within a shoulder. So I think that's really cool to kind of think through those processes and, and be able to identify that and figure mm -hmm. out what is really the, the common problem. But yeah, mm -hmm. I'm like you too. It's hard for me to answer any questions. Um, because it, I'm, as I'm answering, I'm thinking well, of the other five possibilities yep. that possibly could be like, well, this is and I'm like, but I mean, it depends cause it could be yep. this. So it's all kind of contextual and depending. And, and that's, and that's yep. a good thing. You have to look through those and cipher through and figure out what it is. And sometimes a little trial and error and sometimes just some data. Yep, um, and, so, and some knowledge. Having some some good knowledge and being able to see those things is cool. Yeah. Well, and even even one step beyond that is 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 um, identifying what you don't know. Yeah. Right. So um, I like to tell. I always tell patients. I'm like, I'm going to tell you what I know. I'll tell you what I don't know. Yeah. And if it's something that we don't know, 
okay, what's our next step? We need right. to, we need to get you to the person that knows. Right. right? Yeah. So sometimes it's, it's, um, uh, my role is getting them to the, you know, your yeah. role might be getting them you, to, to me, but my yeah. role might be getting them to another person, right, another yeah. provider, another, whatever, um, that, um, that, that can take care of that problem. So, yeah. um, basically kind of having, um, that awareness of, of what people's specialties are and, yeah. and, um, how other people can help different problems and, yeah, that's, it's good to be able to refer out, co-manage people, and because you're mm-hmm. really coming from a place of care and you don't want to be all, I think personal trainers have, over the years, uh, we've got more into corrective exercises, we have those things, so we, we're all now trying to become like, you know, basically physical therapists, and we have to realize, and something that we have to know is that we have a limited, and we can try these things mm-hmm. out, and if they don't work, then we need to bring the people that are that have more of ability and can do more than what we can do and step out of our scope of practice and have more knowledge because uh, you know basically we have a certification if we have any of that extra knowledge because we've spent a lot of time mm-hmm. researching it but it's not yep. a given and uh, not to say anything negative on a lot of personal trainers but uh, a lot of them have a very small knowledge of that but they're trying to act like physical therapists and mm-hmm. put people through PT programs I'm like that's not what we do we teach people how to do safe exercise that's it that's all we do really yeah. and if that goes into weight loss and lean body mass gain and strength and that's 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 an added bonus uh, to all those things yeah. that we do but yeah and you know, I mean, that, well, ultimately we want to work, work together in terms of, of course, co um, How do we, um, you know, if somebody's had an injury, yeah, and they're going back into the gym, yeah. Okay, how do we keep them safe? Yeah. How do we how do we make sure they don't get re-injured and yeah, and uh, working together as a team to make sure that you know, ultimately our client is is we want our client to be healthy and happy yeah. and and uh, be able to um, do the things that they want to do. Yeah and um, keeping them safe so that they can keep doing that yeah it can be a great referral system like i said we if we find something that we just you know is out of our scope of practice and we can't seem to help we send them to you and then hopefully after you kind of address that and get it fixed you want to send somebody back and you kind of want them to have an in-between of them going Mm -hmm. back on their own i have an orthopedic exercise specialty which basically just that kind of opens my scope of practice i'm supposed to be kind of like post rehabilitation so like after you guys are done Uh i might be the next person so because i have somewhat of an understanding of the injury and kind of what to to look for and avoid we can have conversations and then they can mm-hmm. either continue with someone like me or they could go on their own. But I'm uh-huh. sometimes the in-between cool. physical therapy and, and done, uh-huh. uh, which awesome. is really, really cool. Yeah, it's a, it's uh-huh. a great thing. Uh, we have uh, another trainer also has that same cert, but uh, we all we all put ourselves in it just because, like I said, we just realize that so many people mm-hmm. are in pain. So many people have injuries and uh, you have to learn those things. I mean, 80 yeah. percent of everybody's going to have some lower back pain at some sort or mm-hmm. bulging discs as we're learning yep. that more people do. And uh, we have to try to figure out how to kind of work around those things. Yeah. Um, but we'd much rather just people not have pain or a very limited amount of pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if we can help that with knowledge or sending yeah. them to someone like you, then we're, we're more than happy to do that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, I've, I've learned a lot today. So, and, and to that point, there's a lot of people that live with pain. Always. Yeah. Constantly. That, that it just becomes normal. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's your job. My job is to make sure that we get the word out through means like, like this yeah. to go, you know what? That's not normal. Yeah. You, you, you don't, don't you have, don't to, have to live with that all yeah. the time. And, um, and certainly there are, I mean, there are, we all have physical limitations that yeah. we all have to deal with in certain respect and, and, and we want to be realistic, but, um, but there's just tons of people that that are out there and, and just, they They're just put just up with something it. because it's just kind of become normal. And yeah, you know what? It, it doesn't have to be normal. Yeah, it's not to normalize let's, pain. Let's, uh, let's figure out how we can get you back to doing what you want to do. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, I, uh, I appreciate you having you here. I appreciate having somebody out there that's helping people with pain. Like I said, I think it is normalized. I think people deal with lower back pain, knee problems, shoulder problems all the time. And just think this is my life now and it's how I'm going to deal with mm-hmm. it. Um, and really don't realize how much is affecting them uh, until they don't have it anymore. Yep. So it's great for them. And if they have those problems, they should definitely uh, look at, out for you. And, and, uh, and you know, if anybody has questions or anything, because this should be on, I don't know if this portion will be on, yeah. but this should be on uh, Facebook so people can uh-huh. always comment, um, send us stuff. Um, do you have an email address or a contact number? Yep. Um, easy, easiest way to get a hold of us is um, bodyworksphysicaltherapy.net. Okay. Bodyworksphysicaltherapy.net. Um, our phone number is 316-558-8808.
So if anybody, I guess, has so, pains or has some of these things and not knowing or still dealing with tennis elbow and it's been mm -hmm. long, long or said they had a bulging disc and think that that's the, the end mm -hmm. for their for their, for their their ADL back yeah. <laughs> when you're 30 years old, then they can definitely contact you and try to figure out some more things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then if they want to come work out, they can always come back and in here sometime. And come, then come work out. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you, Cody. Yeah. It's been it's been a pleasure. So we're going to sign off. I think we went a little bit over, but that's that's great. It's all good information. And uh, if it, this is on Facebook, you guys can also comment and you can answer them questions there. Okay. Cool. All right, man. Have a, great, it. have a great day. I think it's going right. to warm up. Thank you for listening to the Healthy Living Wichita podcast with Go Time Training. If you enjoyed today's show and want to get started with your own fitness journey, I'd love to help kickstart your goals. How do four 60 minute personal training sessions for $99 with me sound? Head over to www.gotimetraining.com forward slash podcast to claim yours. I can't wait to meet you.